Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. Today we're going to be carrying on with the exceptional story, Slob Gullion. And, I do believe, firstly we need to travel to Vale Garden. So let's go have a look. There should be a crime scene. Ah, Florence and Florence. Fine, Amber. The sign in the window says, closed for business. London's fashionable set must be displeased. This shop once supplied the royal household itself, but now lords and ladies in search of overpriced amber will have to settle for Asprey's down the road. With a key from Concord Square, however, you can open the locked door and investigate. Let's start at the top here. Let's inspect the stock. Precious ornaments gleam under glass. Amber runs the gamut, from pennies per pound to priceless treasures, depending on colour, consistency, cut and all the metrics of the jeweller's market. The earnings generated by these pieces have been inflated, of course, by the shop's failure to account for certain taxes, entitling Concord Square to seize the lot. This lot still hasn't been seized but it's locked until the constables can take inventory. At a glance, you see bracelets and necklaces, pocket watches and filigreed fountain pens, inlaid silverware, cufflinks, buttons, earrings, and even an amber-topped walking stick. All of those things sound fantastic. Uh, let's page through the ledgers. Sales, deliveries, special orders, private accounts. Every import to and export from the fifth city is taxed. Amber is no exception. Mr. Stones and Mr. Hearts both take their cut. Her enduring Majesty's tariffs are also imposed. You can read all the numbers right here, and they even appear to add up. But this shop is the scene of a double homicide for a reason. For the discerning connoisseur, Amber has only one source, Flute Street. All the deliveries in these ledgers were transacted with Mr. McIntosh as a liaison. The most recent, incidentally, was scheduled the same day that Miss Florence and Miss Florence turned up dead. And finally, let's enter the back office. It's messier where customers can't see. Miss Florence and Miss Florence conducted their business from behind this desk, right up until the end, it would appear. The chairs have been toppled, the papers are in disarray. The bookcase, positioned against the rear wall, is broken where someone slammed into the shelves. Chalk outlines helpfully illustrate how both of the sisters were disposed. Miss Florence died where she was sitting, and then must have slumped forward onto the desk. Miss Florence, however, fought back. Her outline beside the bookcase is surrounded by bloodstains that still narrate her panic with lurid detail. Hmm, but there's nothing else we can do here, huh? Okay, well the next place we had to go was Spite. But let's go have a look at Spite. 131C Childcake Street. A derelict address in a disreputable neighbourhood. Not the first place one would expect a constable to call his home, but perfect when the constable is posing as an undercover fence. Perfect until he got strangled in his own bathtub, that is. This flat has already been searched, but perhaps you'll find something that Concord Square missed. Let's examine the bathtub. So this is where it happened. All the bathwater has been drained but there's a bloody ring around the rim. And those marks on the wallpaper nearby? Prints left by suction cups. You can picture the scene. How the victim was pinned down, submerged in the tub. How the tentacles tightened. How the struggle ceased. Drowning or strangling, which actually finished the job. We can search the wardrobe. Officer K's personal effects haven't been removed yet. 
Jackets, scarves, neckties, boots, hats, gloves, more clothes in the dresser, more in the closet. You rummage through a vast collection. No article strikes you as truly unique. Anyone could buy these outfits at the bazaar or Flower Dean Market. But they aren't simply outfits. They're disguises to mingle with zailers, gossip with gamblers and thieves, and blend into the fifth city's criminal underworld. Nothing that would raise eyebrows or draw excessive attention. These boots are rather muddy. Let's have a look at his calendar. It's lying open beside an address book. Here's a meeting with Miss Florence, and here's another with Miss Florence. You page through prior months to find F and F penciled repeatedly. Captain Whitaker's shipping routes, too, have been marked. Dates, deliveries, docking fees for the SS Halcyon. These are just Officer K's latest annotations. Other names, many with criminal records, populate his timetables to form an illegal network spanning years. On the day he was murdered, however, he only had one appointment, right here at 131C Childcake Street, with a party called M.M. M.M. appears almost as often as F and F. Macintosh, I assume. Okay, and the final place we needed to go was Watchmaker's Hill. To go have a look at the wreck of the SS Halcyon. Walk north from Watchmaker's Hill, and the ground grows boggy. Avoid the nettles, and don't touch the toadstools with teeth. Keep walking, and you'll wade into the delta, where the stolen river meets the undersea. Still capsized on the sandbar, where it crashed. The SS Halcyon is already overgrown with black coral. Well, let's study the mud. These must be footprints from Concord Square's salvage operation. The undersea's tides are languid. When the undersea has tides at all. These tracks haven't been washed away yet, but they're not easy to read. You can't even begin to guess how many constables trampled through this area. Too many boots have crossed and recrossed too many paths. The water's edge, however, you identify a trench where something must have been dragged from the river. Something heavy and cadaver sized. Captain Whitaker sized, to be more specific. Search the wreckage. Splintered crates litter the nearest shore. Scavengers have already descended to plunder the wreck. If there were any valuables here, they're long gone. But the crates are stamped with labels like beeswax and jade, and the residue still clinging to the wood is amber-hued. It's also rather slimy. Neither beeswax nor jade, as far as you're aware, leaves such viscous traces. Liquid amber? Or are we looking at honey? <laughs> Who knows? Okay, well I think that's everything. So we go back to Concord Square. Let's navigate through the labyrinth. Taking your sweet time with this one, eh? Asks Sergeant Holly. No, but I would like to speak with the implacable detective. He's still working diligently, even relentlessly, on the case. We have new options in here? Yes, we do. Okay. Let's discuss the crime scenes. What did you learn? Asks the detective. Homicide by homicide, you compare the crime scenes to Concord Square's files. Everything you report, however, has already been documented. I should have known better, says the detective. I thought that a fresh pair of eyeballs would help, but we don't need fresh. We need dead. The workstation is still crowded with beakers and flasks, but now they're brimming with putrid black sludge. Vital essences without vitality. When we die, the last image we see is imprinted on our retinas. Dissect a victim's eyes and you might glimpse their murderer. That's the popular theory at least. 
I doubt that Mr. McIntosh would relish the procedure. Luckily, we have alternatives. Most amber in fallen London is warm to the touch. Sometimes it quivers, sometimes it trembles, but it always remembers. Sensations seep into its core. Impressions reshape its contours. Hold it close to your heart, and its pulse will match yours, even if your heart stops beating. Even if the amber congeals like a corpse's blood. Let's inspect the rubbery corpse's amber. Mr. McIntosh had an impressive chunk in his pocket when he died. It's my business to know everything about London, says the implacable detective. If I don't know something, I find it out. How to read certain tattoos, for instance, or the cargo limit for the Moloch Street Express. Anything could break a case wide open, but Amber is especially informative. Whoever handled it, whatever emotions they felt, the Amber absorbs and preserves that information. I've developed my own system for analysis. She unfolds her stained handkerchief to reveal a chunk. But I've never seen Amber like this. It doesn't tremble or pulse. It's not warm to the touch. It glistens like black glass and oozes a dark, sticky substance resembling tar. Go ahead, says the implacable detective. Take it. The detective discards her handkerchief. Then she peels off the gloves that she was wearing. While you were out and about, I conducted a few tests. This amber is unique in more than one sense. It remembers the river. I don't mean the stolen river. I've treated it with, let's say, a binding agent. You should soon feel the effects. I don't feel anything yet. Just the sticky black sludge that's still oozing from the chunk. Cold enough to make your fingers numb. We have to equip it. Open your possessions menu and equip the chunk of dead amber as a weapon in order to experience more potent effects. There it is. It gives me flexible perception plus one, huh? Let's observe our surroundings. How long has light been able to bend like this? Black sludge seeps into your skin. You can feel it like pins and needles penetrating your pores, numbing your nerves, until you suddenly don't anymore. How do you feel now? asks the detective. Perfectly normal? That can't be right. But you're not numb. Your thoughts are lucid. You're like yourself. Nothing more. Nothing less. But the room? Is this even the same room? What happened to the walls? Why is the air so unbearably dry? You can hear distant doors slamming and kettles boiling and bats snoring. You can taste electricity. You can smell fear. Five senses? How about seven or eight? Maybe more. Well, let's discuss the chunk of dead amber. Whenever you touch it, your flesh crawls and you shiver involuntarily. Amber is impressionable. That chunk experienced everything that Mr. McIntosh did. It won't let you feel exactly what he felt, but your senses should be more elastic. Ah, so we have to revisit the crime scenes in Vale Garden Spite and Watchmaker's Hill. Revisit each location, study them carefully. Each crime scene will provide you with a unique combination of three clues, which you can use to communicate with Mr. McIntosh by matching the clues to different conversational styles. Each crime scene contains clues for one combination, and only one. After you learn the three combinations from the three crime scenes, keep the chunk of dead amber equipped when you speak with Mr. McIntosh. It will open more options to communicate but you'll need to create the right combinations. Well, isn't this going to be interesting? Let's step away, then. Won't speak to him right now. Unless there's an option for just having the, the chunk here. Okay. 
Yeah, I know. There's a few new ways to talk to him here. We have susurration, speech, vibration, viscosity, touch, taste, vision, pantomime, contortion. Let's... And song. Your voice is an instrument. Let's go to the crime scenes first. Let's travel back to Vale Garden. Go back to Florence and Florence. And let's inspect the stock once again. Amber runs the gamut from pennies per throb to priceless pulsations, depending on color, consistency, emotional resonance and all the metrics of the jeweler's market. The earnings generated by these pieces have been inflated, of course, by the shop's failure to account for certain taxes, entitling Concord Square seize the lot. This lot still hasn't been seized, but it's locked until the constables can take inventory. At a glance, you sense greed and envy, pocket peccadilloes and filigreed aspirations, inlaid arrogance, dishonesty, anxiety, disdain, and even a fear of death topped walking stick. Good lord. Let's keep looking around. Nothing's jumping out at me beyond emotional responses. Let's page through the ledgers. Every import and export from the fifth city is taxed. Amber is no exception. Mr. Stones and Mr. Hart both take their cut. The Majesty's tariffs are also imposed, but those are just official charges. Running your fingers down the lines, you can feel dips and divots, imprints left by the nibs of pens pressed into certain pages. Their ghostly echoes still preserve the records from other pages, which someone has meticulously excised. For the discerning connoisseur, Amber has only one source, Flute Street. All the deliveries in these ledgers were transacted with Mr. McIntosh as a liaison, but another liaison collected private fees for each delivery. On the same day that Miss Florence and Miss Florence turned up dead, one delivery and one payment was scheduled. Okay, so there's someone else. Then to the back office. Miss Florence and Miss Florence conducted their business from behind this desk right up until the end, it would appear. The chairs have been toppled, the papers are in disarray, the bookcase positioned against the rear wall is broken where someone slammed into the shelves. Chalk outlines helpfully illustrate how both of the sisters were disposed. You don't need the outlines. Something crackles at the back of your neck. Your limbs move like magnets, oscillating between poles. You pace the office, following a pattern you can't see. This is where the victims fell, but this is where the murderer stood. You can feel it in your muscles. Oh dear, what is the clue? <laughs> they said each crime scene would have a clue to the how to communicate with Mr. McIntyre. You can feel it in your muscle. There's an extra person and inspecting the stock had lots of feelings, throbbings and pulsations. Let's go have a look at another crime scene and see if that maybe opens something up. Let's go to spite. 131C. Let's examine the bathtub. The bath water has been drained, but there's a ring around the rim, blood and bile and something like yolk mingled into the, a crust that says everything with its texture. The sludge's thickness and moisture are eloquence manifested. And on the wallpaper nearby, prints left by immature suction cups add an accent. You can picture the scene, how someone with tentacles inside the tub must have struggled to climb out. How they gripped the rim and braced themselves against the wall. Okay, that's weird. Let's search the wardrobe. Uh, more clothes in the dresser, more in the closet. You rummage through a vast collection. No article strikes you as truly unique. But some are stained with a peculiar 
Colour? What is this colour? You've never seen anything like it before. Your corneas sting. Pain shoots through your skull. Your brain isn't developed to process this hue, or this shade, or whatever eye-blistering pigment might be splattered on Officer K's garments. Hey, the boots are dyed completely. Their colour burns itself into your eyes. Have a look at the calendar. Between more appointments scheduled with F and F, you sense multiple pages missing. Captain Whitaker's shipping routes, too, are incompletely recorded. Dates erased, deliveries altered, docking fees for the SS Halcyon miscalculated. Emotions linger on these documents. Anxiety, camaraderie, disgust. Represented by chemical residues too subtle for most humans to detect. But your nose twitches, your tongue quivers. On the day he was murdered, Officer K only had one appointment, right here at 131C Childcake Street. But the MM on the calendar was added later. Flavours like beard oil and brine are quite pronounced. There's somebody else involved. That's what we're learning from this. Finally, Watchmaker's Hill. Back to the wreck. Study the mud. The undersea's tides are languid, when the undersea has tides at all, but it would take multiple floods to wash the carnage from this coast. You can hear Concord Square in the mud. Bubbles rise from the quagmire and burst, counting the constables whose boots left prints. 10, 11, 12, 13. At the water's edge, the waves are counting too. They whisper against the rocks. Once, twice, thrice, for every corpse that was later Lee dragged ashore. Two corpses were fresh, the waves whisper, but one had already started to rot. Let's study the wreckage. Splintered crates litter the nearest shore. Scavengers have already descended to plunder the wreck. If there are any valuables here, they are long gone. But the crates are vibrating with motives, like murder and misdirection. And the residue still clinging to the wood is alibi hued. It's also rather slimy. Neither murder nor misdirection. As far as you're aware, leave such viscous traces, unless a dead body has dazed to decompose. Interesting. There was dead bodies in the wreckage? In the crates? Investigate the coral. Look across the river, even further to the north, and you'll see more black coral. It glitters along the coast, creeping from the undersea to invade the prick finger wastes. It also grows under the waves, up too close to a submerged reef, and this coral will shred any ship like a head of lettuce. Clearly, the SS Halcyon cut too close, as the coral itself corroborates. With every splash, the polyps speak, and with every groan from the vessel's wrecked hull, you hear history lapping against the metal. Month after month, and voyage after voyage, the Halcyon skirted these shoals expertly, until someone else took the helm from Captain Whitaker. Oh, so someone replaced the captain. I also don't remember reading the coral one before I equipped this thing. Did I just not do that? Oh well, I'm sure I'll find out when I edit it. Um, <laughs> let's travel back to... Concord Square. I don't really have any inclinations as to how I should speak to our friend here. Is there anything new in here? Identical in every way, both corpses are still encrusted with amber jewellery. It glimmers and gleams with an intensity that rings inside your eyes, inside your ears, inside your skull. Your senses are instruments, and the amber plays you. Coroner does not enjoy how the pendants chant and the bracelets warble. There's a knife flash, reserved in a signet. Two blows to the skull, 
in two earrings. And the amber-studded necklaces remember the grip of gloved hands. And they weren't strangled till after they were dead. Officer K, let's have a look at him. The conciliatory coroner understands if you need a moment. Smelling stalls? No. How adorable. Even endearing, but no. They won't address what's worse about this corpse. No, they certainly won't. You need some new species of spectacles to protect your eyes. What colour is that? Every fleshy lump throbs with a horrible phosphorescence. Unlike the rest of him, Officer K's head and shoulders haven't quite dissolved yet. Not from soaking in water, but from a very recent treatment of corrosive acid. You can still see the acid eating. Then Captain Whitaker. The SS Halcyon was his faithful ship. Merciful heavens, there's murder, and then there's this. The effects of black coral, according to the coroner, but the coroner isn't correct. Both arms, one at the shoulder and one at the elbow, have been sliced away. This wasn't done by coral, it was surgical. The bones tell you when it happened, narrating the sequence with their twisted arrangement. After he was dredged from the stolen river, someone amputated Captain Whitaker's limbs. His bloated marrow confirms it. Do you see his neck? The coroner helpfully draws your attention to the suction cupped, shaped bruises. While well, this man went underwater, he was already dead. Hey, okay. um. Serration vibration. Viscosity. Much taste. Vision. Don't really know what to do here. I'm gonna be honest. So let's let's just pick some and see what happens. Let's do susurration. Your mouth moves, but you don't speak. Or with words. You mumble, you hiss and you spit. You drone and hum, mutter and groan shaping syllables into rhythms that pound your palate and spray like Z-foam between your teeth. Sound the depths. You surface again with intonations seized like sunken treasures from your voice box. Your mouth moves, and the air itself moves like the undersea. Mr. McIntosh sways back and forth, rocking with the tide. Okay, so C. There's also viscosity in the crates. Let's see if we can go with that. Add oil, subtract saliva, multiply by mucus. Chart the false stars at Z if you're a sailor navigating strange currents. If you're navigating a conversation with a rubbery man, chart the slime. In the thickness of phlegm and the coagulation of blood, there are whole constellations and your handkerchief is a galaxy. Mr. McIntosh needs no sextant or astrolabe. He might need you to sneeze again, however, or drink some water. That last heading was a little dry. And then finally, let's go with vision. Gaze into each other's eyes, try not to blink. The longer you look at Mr. McIntosh, the less you see. Colours swirl inside his eyes, outside his eyes. The world recedes, diminishes, dissolves. Nothing remains except his gaze, and your gaze plunging into his like a diver for pearls. What pearls could you find down here in the watery abyss? What oysters might open their secret, hinged shells? And what jewels do they hoard? How long can you even stay submerged? No longer. Your eyes sting. You have to blink. But the rubbery corpse doesn't blink. His stare deepens. Oh dear. Mr. McIntosh is wheezing at an alarming rate. You're exhausted. Mr. McIntosh is exhausted. These exertions have come to nothing. You both slump backward like a pummeled prize fighters on the ropes. The implacable detective stands behind you. Don't worry so much about grammar. He massages your shoulders. Put your prepositions wherever you want. Split your 
infinitives. As long as you understand each other, that's what matters. Okay, although it's possible to combine communication styles in many different ways, only a few combinations will allow you to make progress. The non require random trial and error to unlock. Visit the crime scenes in Velgarden Spite and Watchmaker's Hill to uncover clues for three of the correct combinations. So that's not it. Okay, this is interesting. I don't think I've ever done anything like this in Fallen London before. Let's go back. Let's go back to Velgarden. I'm going to take some time here and, and, and look through stuff. I'll, I'll cut it out of the video because it's probably not very fun to watch. Okay, funny story. I think I've worked out what I need to do and it took me a lot longer than I'm willing to admit. I've been sitting here for minutes. Um, It's the bloody picture at the bottom, isn't it? This. It's this. <laughs> I was reading through this. I'm like, ah, oh, throb, pulsations, aspirations. Where can I get from? What can I get from this? And um, it's this. So I let me just write this down. We're gonna double check, basically. So it's like weird. They've probably got names. I'm just gonna put weird triangle thing. Triangle. That's touch. I know that's touch. And. That's pantomime. Let's let's get out of here. Let's let's travel back. If this is the case, I am so happy because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> it was the first time I was sitting there. And I'm like, wow, am I really just not getting this mystery? Do am I going to have to write everything down and try and work this out? But let's speak with them. Right. So it starts off with the with the triangle. So that's vibration, the right frequency for the right message. Your hums rumble and your throat reverberates. Your lungs expand until your rib cage shakes. Your vocal cords are strings that twang and shiver, sending little shock waves through your flesh and through the air. Even your teeth, your ears that listen well enough, tremble. Mr. Macintosh doesn't have ears, but he can still hear your skull resonate like a skeletal tuning fork. His glands quiver with a sympathetic tone. You echo back and forth into each other. All right, then it's touch, which I have already read before, I believe. Is it different? Take someone's hand and their grip might convey anything from a welcome to a warning. Shake a rubbery man's tentacles and the range of expression is subtler still. Palpitate those tentacles and you'll probe meanings deeper than words can express. Meanings deeper than flesh. Muscular, vascular, lymphatic and nervous. Punctuated by pressure points and underscored with arteries and cartilage. Not that you've necessarily prepared to appreciate every tactile nuance yourself. This is rather like plunging your arms up to the elbow into a heap of rotten fish. Right, and then finally it was pantomime? Signs. Gestures, postures, much can be said by striking a pose. With the art of pantomime, you don't merely describe subjects, you embody them. If no other language can capture the specific tilt of a head or the character of a slouch, then you can tilt your head and slouch. You can walk, run, crouch, creep, jump, dance, stumble, shrug, slide along the walls, fall to the floor, and reenact scenes like an actor on stage. Mr. Macintosh wriggles and slaps his tentacles. Is that applause? Did that make any sense? Let's find out. Ha ha ha! This looks interesting. Consider the rubbery corpse's response. In a dialogue, one party speaks and one listens. It's your turn to listen. Mr. Macintosh chirps. If a chirp is what you'd call these piping, slurping smacks, clacking away like keys on a typewriter. You barely keep up with the cascade of sound. Every inflection holds information, every hiccup is a code. Numbers flood into your head, dates, weights, tariffs, bribes, more bribes, and even more bribes. The rubbery corpse is reeling through outstanding debts, interests occurred, loans and lines and data contained in each pop and spurt, preceded by Mr. Macintosh's vibrating papillae. 
an impression mathematically accumulates. Miss Florence and Miss Florence were bleeding money, with payments siphoned monthly from their accounts. But how did they die? asks the implacable detective. Mr. McIntosh shrugs. Oh. Okay, so that, that, that is the solution. I need to go back into those other crime scenes with my second sight. Note what the, the image for the resonance is, and we can use that to continue talking to Mr. Martin McIntosh. But I do think, because this episode's gone on for quite a while, I'm going to end it here. We'll pick this up in the next episode. Hopefully this helps people who are trying to do this themselves. It took me longer than I'd like to admit. Admittedly, my running time is inflated quite a lot. But this might end up being a short episode. Oh no. I'm sure it'll be fine. But either way, thank you all very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. Thank you again to the members of the channel and the coffee supporters. It really does mean the world to me. But as always, I'll see you next time.